Hey, what's up, everybody? Isaac here, Civil Engineering Academy. Excited to be with you on another podcast episode. Today, I bring a special guest on, Robert Otani. He works for a fantastic firm called Thornton Tomasetti. But fascinating interview. He's the chief technology officer there. We talk all about technology, technology uh, that he helped develop in his own firm, how he found his way from engineering into technology, how he's developing apps for his own firm, and really what all firms should be doing, and really kind of the future of where we're headed with machine learning and AI and how these tools can better help you in your workplace and the firm you're working for. Um, there are many firms out there that, that they're not developing new technology that's helping them at the firm. Sometimes they are falling behind. And so we talk about kind of his timeline of this whole thing and where we're headed. So it's a fascinating interview with Robert. I hope you really enjoy it. Uh, I know I did. Reach out to him on LinkedIn. We'll make sure we leave his uh, contact information if you have any questions for him. And uh, we just really Really enjoyed it. So without further ado, let's get to my interview with Robert coming up right after this. Hey, before we start diving into this awesome podcast episode with lots of nuggets of awesome wisdom uh, that we're going to help you with, I want to take a moment to highlight our awesome partner, Civil Engineer Gear. As a civil engineer myself, this is hands down the go-to destination for sleek and professional looking day-to-day -day gear with a civil engineering flair. You can bet that it's mine for sure. So whether you're on the job site, the job office, you're burning the midnight oil, studying for your exams, or you're just chilling at home on the weekends, which many of us do, there is is civil engineering inspired products there that combine functionality and professionalism to be your companion, your best companion during those days you want to check out. I definitely love the comfortable t-shirts and sweatshirts. I'm wearing one right now. I don't start my day without a awesome drink. One of my favorite drinks and their awesome canteens. We also have awesome mugs and don't even get me started on the spacious bags that they have there. They're big enough for all of my personal protective equipment, my PPE, shove it all in there, carry it with me and it's not so big that you can't carry it around it's just it's actually a perfect fit you can use it for your gym clothes you can wear it, use it for your camping gear yoga whatever it is you name it throw it in the back now the best part of all this is that shipping is free on all orders so if you are interested in getting some sweet civil engineering gear check it out at civilengineeredgear.com and make sure to treat yourself with some awesome gear and accessories tailored specifically to your professional and personal life as a civil engineer but check it out you won't be disappointed. All right, we are live and recording. Robert, thank you for joining me on the Civil Engineering Academy podcast. I appreciate you doing this with me. Appreciate being here. Thanks for inviting me. I always love to start these off by kind of you telling us a little bit about your own background and I guess what led you into engineering in the first place. Yeah. Um, well, it, it kind of helped that my, my, my dad was an engineer. He was a chemical engineer and, uh, um, but you know, he never really talked about engineering. It was just, it, it, it just, you know, you know, as I'm growing up, I'm thinking that's, that's a potential option for me, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, he, he, uh, was, um, Mostly by the time I, you know, sort of was aware that he was an engineer, he was, he was at something called market. They, in his company, which was an oil refinery engineering type company, marketing was like business development. Um, so he would, you know, have to travel all around the world, mostly the Middle East, um, you know, because of water refineries and oil processing, um, uh, to get projects um so they're huge projects you know big oil refineries sometimes he also did power plants too so, uh, anyway so that's you know and then of course in high school i was terrible at english and language and very good at math and science so that 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 was e relatively easy decision for me to get into engineering or engineering awesome so so can you tell us where you went, where you're working today, how you ended up there too? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I should say that I, I graduated with a civil engineering degree with a focus actually on construction management, um, at, from Rutgers university in New Jersey. And, uh, that was back in 1990 actually. I graduated. And I did work for two and a half years at a civil sanitary engineering company. In New Jersey, I didn't 
it was great leader and learning experience because there's a lot of field experience, but uh, I didn't really think that I wanted to be there my entire career. So then I went back to college, got my master's at Penn State University uh, in structural engineering. Uh, and then uh, this is dating myself, but I got the job through a New York Times ad paper. <laughs> uh, and uh, it was a it was a very because it was also a pretty funny story. So I went into the interview in New York City for Thomas Setti was at uh, Sixth Avenue, and uh, the the person that interviewed me um, basically asked me where I went to college and when I can start. That that was the extent of the interview. Um, but the funny thing was the reason I got hired was to be an engineer for the, the JFK Terminal 1 project. Mm -hmm. um, and that project is in the process of being torn down and rebuilt. So that, that no, you know, you're getting old when more projects are actually being torn down. So um, uh, the, the first phase of the project we're working on, um, it's not touching the existing terminal, but the next phase will. So... Uh, a little bit of a shame but also just it's, 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 uh, full cycle full cycle, full cycle. yes <laughs> exactly well uh give our audience the for maybe those that don't know a little bit about Tomasetti and i guess what they really special yeah why uh, is that is they're famous for sure you know thornton Tomasetti. when i started we were only about a hundred people i would say uh in we had kind of three divisions, structural engineering, um, renewal, which is like, uh, you know, renovation of existing buildings and, uh, forensics. And we also did some architecture too, for, for industrial type facility, the architecture we, we have, we don't do anymore, but it's grown since then. So we're now we're over 50 offices, uh, about 1700 people and our, the, the practices of the type of engineering we do has grown um, to Teddy practice. So, um, that partially was accelerated by when we emerged with, uh, Weininger Associates in 2015. Um, so a very diverse multidisciplinary firm now. Awesome. Big firm worked on big buildings that does a lot of different, uh, touches a lot of different aspects of civil engineering. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a, could you talk a little bit about how you found yourself into the technology side? Because one of the big pieces and where I see you a lot online is talking about technology, how to improve technology for a firm. How did you end up there? Yeah, great question. So when I was, um, so uh, I was at a, I joined Lawrence Thomas Study in 95. I left in 2000. I went to a company called Parsons Brinkerhoff, which is now part of WSP. And then I uh, left uh, Parsons Brinkerhoff in 2004, went to a company called Arab, an even larger firm, um, you know, 17,000 or more personal firm. Um, and during that time, um, uh, BIM came around. So Revit was introduced with 2003 or four. And uh, my um, principal in charge of our product decided that he wanted us to do BIM on his project. For the you know for the first project in in, in all of Arab, or at least as far as I knew. So I had to learn really really fast how to implement Revit on a project. Um, this is it was a brand new software. And people struggle with it today. Imagine when it was a brand new software. Mm. So. Many weekends learning Revit uh, and even learning about work sharing. Like if we did, that was a new concept about when we're working in the same model and and, uh, and you know working together with uh, uh, with others. Uh, so that's how I got into it. And then when I joined Thornton, rejoined Thornton Tana in two thousand eight, um, they decided that every project or Tom Scarangello, who was, who was the CEO at the time decided that every project was going to be BIM, which was a big move, particularly at that particular time. So I was instrumental, at least, uh, in helping the company both market it externally, but also train people internally about BIM and, and rabbit. That's how I got into it. 
Yeah. And so from from there, um, did you become kind of the the tech hub for pushing new ideas, and has that grown into its own department at your company? It has. So again, this is like a, a really a interesting time at 2008 because at the same time we were working on the Barclays Arena project, which very complex project, um, very fast paced project. And, um, so we had both Revit, we had three different software that had to talk to each other all at the same time, which was Revit. We're on the design documentation side. We had, um, one of the architects at the time was using a uh, digital project, which is a Katia, essentially is Katia. Uh, very advanced software, uh, and our steel, the steel fabrication team was using Teclan, and we had to somehow, um, you know, uh, merge all of the right information at the right time um, to 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 the to the various software, and so um, we had a small team at that point creating plugins that would allow us to update the data between those software. Um, the reality is, is the pro we would not have finished that project without this. Um, so that was that sort of customization of software and plugins, uh, having the interoperability between software, as well as soon after that, uh, Grasshopper, Rhino Grasshopper was released, uh, maybe 2010, I believe. And that I had discovered uh, when I was teaching. I was teaching an architecture school, uh, structural engineering and architecture school, and the students were using it. And, uh, you know, I saw the visual scripting. It made a lot of sense, very logical. Um, and then uh, we said, uh, you know, it, it allowed parametric modeling, so changing geometry on the fly. And we started to use it in our practice. Uh, we were one of the first groups to use something called uh, Geometry Gem, which is a uh, plugin for Grasshopper to multiple structural engineering software uh, and BIM software. And uh, yeah, so we, we were spinning around with stadium projects that normally would take us, you know, three weeks. We would do it in, you know, four days, something like that, that level. Did you have to learn code? Did you self learn that? And then maybe the bigger question there is would you encourage other civil engineers to learn code? Yeah, no matter what great, discipline they're in. That's a great question. I so this it was actually a funny story. Um I knew how powerful Grasshopper could be, which is which is a form of visual code coding. Um uh, and of course I, I had learned um you know programming in college. Uh again dating myself again. At that time it was Fortran and then base we turned it to basic, which is very much like Python actually. Um, so, uh, I took a weekend course, um, to learn grasshopper. So, um, a two day course, sort of, uh, you know, immersive course work all day long. And you would, you would walk out of there at least having enough sense of knowing where to go to find all the components and what the capabilities of grasshopper were. Um, and of course, uh, I was fairly senior at that point. Uh, so I was running projects as opposed to being production on projects. So my skills sort of dropped off soon after. But the person that I went with, uh, uh, Jonathan Schumacher, who was, uh, is, is, who was doing this all the time, he was great, at it, just phenomenal. And so um, he became like the mentor for everyone in the firm. We would do training in the offices. So to answer your question, yes, I think people should all be exposed to it, even if they're not users, to understand the capabilities. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, a lot of in civil engineers, they're overwhelmed by how much college they already have to take, and then they have to pass their exams to become professional engineers. And now we're yeah. looking ahead at where technology is going, and we're using so much software to help design stuff. You know, I, you know, personally, I wish I had more of that in my own tool belt. 
but uh, I think some engineers feel like that's another thing that they may have to to tack on there. And I, I, I agree with you. I think it would be a great skill to bring to the table. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I sympathize with all of that because, um, in it, and I think that's one of the challenges that we have today, as opposed to when I, uh, even was, was a young engineer. I mean, you know, I, I mentioned before this, the recording that when I started in 1995, there was three computers for about a hundred people. <laughs> so, you know, we did everything on a, on a calculation pad. And then once in a while, we'd run over to the computer and do some analysis, you know, Again, we have maybe, maybe we had three or four different software, not thirty or forty like we have now or more. Um, so uh, it was in many ways it was easier to learn. Um, it was very structured how we do now. There's we have options, many, many, many options, and so that's partly my job now is to fill it is to create best practices around technology. And so. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I guess for our audience maybe just give very briefly a high level of some of the software you've developed. I've, uh, I've heard you talk about the software construe skipper thread, and even those Re Revit plugins that you've got, but yeah. uh, are you developing these for other companies? Can people buy and use these or is they, are, are they just limited to the firm you're with or? Yeah, we, I mean, I'm glad you said that because we are actually going to start, um, offering them for, 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 for other companies, um, you know, for a small fee or some, some of them are free. I mean, a lot of our stuff is free actually. So, um, we, you know, Eva, I mentioned grasshopper. So we have a, we have a, a free toolbox called T T T toolbox and it's on the food for Rhino website. And it's, it's one of the most popular, uh, plugins that exists in grasshopper actually it's like top 10 i think so over 100,000 downloads of the software um you know it has fairly straightforward stuff but 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 you know things that we needed and so therefore we created the plugin and released it you know uh it's kind of the way, way it worked and there, there's a very nice community in the grasshopper community for people sharing uh plugins um Revit started a long, long time ago. That started as a continuation of um, AutoCAD plugins. So we used to have plugins that did, um, you know, column load, uh, you know, a, a trim area takeoffs, let's say, or or translations into, or, or we would take, let's say, at the time RAM uh, structures uh, was, uh, you know, a, a very uh, sort of, popular software, we would take that information, bring it over to AutoCAD, you know, in a unique way, in a custom way. And we kept doing that. And so now we have probably 80 to 90 Revit plugins, and they're the most popular plugins we have um, because people are in there all the time, right? Uh, in that all in that platform all the time. Um, Construe started, you know, kind of with a spin-off, as I mentioned, with Barclay Center. We, we, we understood that having um, data transfer between software so that we wouldn't have to manually um, do, you know, mark up a drawing and then have someone make those changes. We wanted a push button solution. And so um, uh, it's a very good software. And, and we, uh, we just did a podcast, or not a podcast, sorry, a webinar with Autodesk actually as a partner. And, um, I think that, you know, they're pushing the, they're, they're really making a big push for structural engineering and interoperability. So it's a, it's a good combination, of, uh, uh, you know, workflow that, that, uh, construe allows. Well, I, I I'm amazed by all the things that you've developed. Yeah. I think it's, awesome. it's been, it's, how long is it? It's been almost 13 years, you know, our, probably 13 years doing this, you know? So we're in the situation of actually a large percentage of our time is just keeping the software functioning. Uh, you know, we, all software has bugs. You know, you, you you download your apps on your, your phone, your iPhone, whatever. There we be like, you know, 50 to a hundred, 
you know, updates. It's not new functionality. It's just bugs that show up um, in, the, in the code. And it's, there's so many dependencies on software these days that, that, that sense. yeah, there, there's a, a roll on effect. And when one, one, you know, one library makes a change and you have to update your software. <laughs> so that's the way it works. Sounds messy a little bit. I, uh, it's, I think we've kind of established a nice timeline here of where you started, how you got into this technology field with engineering, some of the software you've developed, where do you see things going in the future? You know, four seems to be a huge year with AI, machine learning, where are we headed with some of that? Well, um, I, I'm a huge proponent of AI to start with. We've been researching AI since 2000, you know, more specifically machine learning since 2015. And the reason is, is really two reasons. The first reason is, is, uh, you know, when, um, one of my developers explained it to me, he says, you know, you take a bunch of solved solutions, you know, designs, call it, you run an algorithm and sooner or later, if you have a, you create a, train a model, you just ask this very smart set of data question and it'll give you the answer. The answer is never going to be, or likely not going to be exactly the right answer. Although I would also argue that there is no right answer. Typically in structural engineering or any engineering there's it's close enough or it's just it needs to be close enough. And so that excited me because, um, you know, broadly I see AI as um, for engineering firms, that is, is knowledge transfer, um, is, is being able to encapsulate engineering knowledge into a thing and then being able to regurgitate it or have access to it. Let's say that's probably the view of access, have access to it when it's, when it's needed. And, um, and, and I would say the reason why that solves a couple of problems is the first problem is I think that modern uh, software, say from CSI or say from Autodesk or AI, any of them that you buy, they're made for one, one stage of the design, in my opinion. Um, I was speaking mostly about structural engineering software. It's for co it's construction documents. But the reality is, it's only about mm, 30 or 40% of our, our design fit or design fees is in construction documents. About 40%, maybe even sometimes 50% is in the, is leading up to that, is from schematic design to de design development through that whole phase, where we don't need to know the very exact information um, that, you know, a set of construction documents requires. It's more about getting the enough information so that the client and the, the architects can, 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 you know, sort of build upon uh, the design as, as they get to the, you know, CD level. So I see at least initially the machine learning app that we've been developing is tools for early design, get enough information, um, to move the, move the process along, uh, without having to do a very rigorous, uh, analysis and, you know, full building analysis, and then having to throw 50% of the way because changes the architectural changes can be, which happens a lot for us. Um, or we have value engineering or the project is too expensive for the budget. So um, I, I see it as a more efficient way of getting to, um, uh, you know, getting through those early phases when there's a lot of iterations. I think that definitely makes sense. I know you're speaking from the structural engineering field. Um, I work in the utility world and there's software that's used, you know, for all kinds of design cases. I work in transmission and the heavy software they use there is PLS CAD. Uh, I'm curious from your perspective, I think many people are wondering, you know, am I going to have a job? <laughs> is, uh, is AI going to take over? Are there certain jobs that maybe you won't need as many people for, or even, you know, if we're using AI as a tool now, do you need less engineers and maybe they are overseeing and checking that? What, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? 
my thoughts are, um, I think there will be in certain phases, less engineers required, no question about it. But I also see that as being, um, solving a little bit of a problem. I mean, you know, there, there, no, the only way to make more money in, a, in an engineering company is do something faster. Um, which means that you need to do something with less people or less time, say. And I, that's why I think AI can solve that issue. I don't think it's going to be, an, I think, a number of years before AI gets good enough to where it's going to actually replace people. I think at the, be at, at the, at the best case scenario, it's just because we're going to get better sort of hopefully profitability um, and then actually be adapting to the fact that and I tell us to people, you know, again, given, given how long we've been in the business, we do way more than we used to. And like two or three times more, I'm going to say. And our fees have really just incremented with inflation, not with the expectation of what we need to do today. Um, uh, so I think it's just, it's really just solving some problems initially. Uh, down the road, maybe it might, it might, uh, you know, sort of replace some of what the work that the, the one to two year engineers do. Um, but I, I almost see that as a positive because I don't see that, that typically that work, the very mundane, you know, designing thousand beams for me or design a thousand columns for me is, uh, is, is really necessary anymore. You know, it's, it's, I think, I think, and again, one of the things that I'm hopeful for and we're, we're working towards is how AI can actually train engineers faster. And the way we, 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 we used to learn, right, is to do things over and over and over and over again. And over time, we'd make mistakes along the way. And over time, you would see, you would, you would sort of use your own AI, your own neural network to, you know, understand an answer just by looking at something. Um, so if you're exposed, but the only way to do that is to do a thousand of them, right? Do a thousand. But AI can, we can design a thousand beams in a second or a minute or something. So if an engineer can get exposed to all of those, the nuances uh, of, uh, of, of, of what makes the right beam size of the right column size really, really early, or in a shorter amount of team, time, that's 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 valuable for for an engineering company. Um, how are are you using AI in any way right now in your own workplace? Yeah, um, in 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 pockets, I would say. So the interesting thing is we we we've, we've made a lot. I mean, of structural engineering applications, um, and I call them micro apps. Um, you know, design one column or design one beam. Uh, those types of orders, Dynas Lab, we're, we're starting to expand that, uh, which is, which is nice, but we have to make sure that it works for how the engineers work. Um, so the, on the structural side, we've been using AI for a while, um, in here or there, not, I would say at scale, I would say yeah. specific projects, uh, would it make sense? But the interesting thing is, you know, I've been talking about it internally, um, AI, a lot of what my role is to do is to educate people about new technologies. Um, so especially with AI, because there's so much, there's so much news about it and there's so many sort of negative things that are talked about it, then I need to focus on, yes, there are some things that could be negative, but how do we leverage it for our use in the smartest, best way? Um, so the nice thing about it is that we have many practices beyond structural engineering now using AI. AI is great for predictive analysis. So we're using it for predicting, you know, climate, um, future climate patterns. Um, and we're using it for um, facade design. So we're using it for AI to um, calculate embodied energy, embodied carbon of the facade components, assemblies. Um, we're also using it for calculating um, energy usage, energy model. Um, 
and we're using it for a visual detection, which is, we, almost, we already have a, a separate company called TGD2 that has been spun out of our, our, our R&D uh, efforts um, uh, using computer vision for facade damage. So it's, it's grown significantly. And once people realize, uh, I think what, what it can do, um, there's going to be, uh, uses across the company and not even outside of technical, even in human resources, or e we're actually using marketing. Um, uh, we're using like a, a our own version of chat GPT, um, to, to, uh, look into mark old marketing. Um, material so that we can quickly pull out information. I mean, it, what, and you know, what Lars Magus models and open AI did in the last six months is pretty unbelievable. I mean, if just technically it's unbelievable and, and you can think of it as it can read yeah. a million documents and give you a summary in under 20 seconds. It's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh it's an exciting year. I think twenty twenty four is I think we'll see an explosion where we are seeing these tools, types of tools affecting every area of companies we work for and uh, including marketing and other areas. So Yeah. Um Robert, this has been a fascinating interview. Thank you for giving us an update on the technology that's used out there. Thank you for sharing your uh, insights as to AI and maybe where we're headed with engineering and AI. I really do appreciate you uh, jumping on and sharing the, uh, your wisdom. No, I really appreciate you inviting me. It was a great, great discussion. All right. Robert, is there a good way for anyone to contact you if they had more questions or wanted to ask you anything? Yeah, I mean, uh, LinkedIn is always good. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Um, they can also just email me directly, you know, rotani at Um that's that's probably the most direct way, but LinkedIn is good too because I I post, I try to post you know often, um, when something comes to mind or I have an event coming up. So uh, yeah. those are probably the two best methods. Well, perfect. We'll go ahead and link those in our show notes as we get this rolling. But I appreciate you doing this. I hope you have a great weekend. All right, appreciate it. Have a great one. All right, see ya. 